Welcome to Micro, a podcast for short but powerful writing. I'm your host, Drew Hawkins. This episode is our season one finale, and we've got a good one for you. Power plays, freedom, and defiance are themes found in these three pieces of microfiction, from medieval times to New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. They range from magical to somber, humorous to gory. This first piece offers a spin on a magical creature, at once rendering it, like the moon, into something else entirely. It's called Teacup Werewolf. It was written by Jan Stinchcomb and published by Wigleaf in November 2019. Enjoy! Teacup Werewolf Whatever you do, don't forget to feed the werewolf, Mom said before she died, or maybe it was before she left for Paris. We knew what she meant. He was the furry little creature who lived in our china closet, tucked into what happened to be my favorite teacup from our grandmother's set, which was hand-painted in a sentimental shade of pink with a gold edge. Mom said the werewolf gave us the blessing of perspective. He was so tiny it was easy for us to meet his needs, so old his bite could not transmit the dreaded infection. One of us would offer him a slender finger to gnaw on, and then a quick cauterization with a silver lighter would heal the wound. If he had been the usual size, Mom said, we would have been terrified and screaming on every full moon, trying to evade all that murderous manliness, or manly murderousness, or beastly drooling. He was cute and small, and therefore our maternal hearts felt the need to nurture and protect him. Once, during an earthquake, I carried him outside in his teacup home. Family heirloom? a neighbor asked. You know it, I told her, treating the werewolf to three silver sprinkles, the kind the FDA warns you not to eat. Sometimes, on hot evenings or long weekends, our husbands would threaten to get rid of him. Our laughter rang like silver bells. Where are you going to find a gun that small? Bullets that small? And don't forget, if you want to kill him, it takes a silver bullet to the heart, fired by the one he loves. On cue, my sisters and I would glance at each other, then down into the teacup, then over at the mirror, trying to catch a glimpse of true love or facial hair, whichever came first. Jan Stinchcomb is the author of two novellas and a chapbook, and has stories in the Best Small Fictions 2018 and 2021, as well as Best Microfiction 2020. You can find her on Twitter at Jan Stinchcomb, or on her website at janstinchcomb.com. This next piece captures all the delightful gore of a medieval drama, but it's more than just gratifying. There's something haunting beneath the surface. It's called Lord Randall. It was written by Stephanie Yu and published by Longleaf Review. Enjoy. Lord Randall. At first, it's just a low feeling at the base of your tongue, a knot being tied. But then it tugs like a rope being pulled at both ends by a pair of black hogs, squealing and stamping and straining until your gut's near to bursting. And then you recall how earlier that day, when you went to the holler to shoot down some buck, you discovered your true love crouching over a pot, fanning a fire as bright as her hair. How she jumped when she saw you, her eyes flashing green. How she fished out from murky oil, fried sagrasso sea eels that you gladly took whole. How she undid your trousers and swallowed you whole. 
how it all felt so good that you ignored the knot that was forming as you kissed her farewell, till it cinches you sharp as you're leaving the holler, travels up through your gullet, radiates out past your limbs, compels you to the ground where you begin to crawl low on the grass and think not of black cauldrons or ropey eels or murky oil, but of your cattle herd of four and twenty that will soon go to your dear mother, your pieces of silver that will go to your moonshine-drunk father, your gold chain that will adorn your little sister, not yet old enough to crawl like you are crawling now, like the eels slithering from your throat across the doorstep of your mother's home, where you're vomiting green and your mother is screaming, where you been, what you done, and you're recounting the eels and the red hair and the green eyes till she cries, great Lord Jesus. Because now it's not just eels and green coming up, but it's blood and it's black, and you're screaming for a rope with which your true love can hang her pale neck till all the light goes out from those wretched green eyes. Only what you're saying makes no sense at all, because it's just retching and bile and brew, and in the interstices growing shorter between your heaves and your gags, are the strains of a song your mother is singing, and fain would lie dune. A lost lullaby, and fain would lie dune. And she's rocking, and you're rocking, and fain would lie dune. And the words rock you both as her voice bends and quavers with the strangeness of most sounds that echo around the holler. Stephanie Yu is a writer and attorney in Los Angeles whose work has appeared in Hobart, Phoebe Journal, X-Ray, and elsewhere. You can find her on social media at stfu underscore Stephanie or on her website at stephanieyu.webnode.com. This final piece combines the power of voice with a historic event, using a small moment to emphasize massive devastation. It's called Mercury Forges. It was written by Maurice Ruffin, originally published by Appalachia Review, and appears in his new book titled The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You, which comes out August 17th, 2021. Enjoy! Mercury Forges by Maurice Carlos Ruffin My job was to make sure Mercury Forges didn't escape. He was a stocky black guy in for drugs and guns. He'd gotten out of Orleans Parish prison twice, and no one knew how he did it. Funny thing is, he got captured within a few blocks of the prison both times. I get turned around out there, Deputy Benoit. Mercury once said, but I'll get free for good. Just you wait. When the hurricane hit and flooded everything, we brought the inmates out to the broad street overpass. I wasn't too panicked because one of the other deputies, Ronnie Dismas, said our families had made it out of town before the water came. It'd be easy to look after myself with them out of harm's way. Mercury snuck away as soon as I turned my back. He was in a P-Row, about five blocks away, bobbing like an apple. I ran across the overpass and climbed down some scaffolding to his boat, which I grabbed. We hadn't cuffed any of the inmates. It would have been impossible to move them with all the climbing we had to do to get to dry land. Where do you think you're going? I asked. I had a hand. On my sidearm. Gotta find Humanity Street, he said. That's where my pops lives. I knew his dad. A good guy who delivered food plates we deputies ate for lunch. I liked his dad. But that shouldn't have mattered at that moment. I can't really tell you 
why I didn't make him bring us back to the detention center. After a while, we floated up to a yellow house with flood water, almost to the awning. Mercury yanked the metal pole from the water, broke through the attic window, and climbed in. There was shuffling inside, and I wondered if I should go in after him. I thought this might be part of his big getaway plan, but soon he grunted out of the window and pulled his father's body out wrapped in a heavy blanket. The old man hadn't had a chance. Bring us back, Depp, said Mercury. And that was what I did. Maurice Carlos Ruffin is the author of The Ones Who Don't Say They Love You and We Cast a Shadow. You can find him on Twitter and Instagram at Maurice Ruffin. Micro is edited and curated by Dylan Evers and produced and hosted by me, Drew Hawkins. Our theme song is by Matt Ordez. You can find all the information about this episode's writers, their featured work, and the publications where they were published, as well as a transcription of this episode in the show notes. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, this is our season one finale. But never fear, this episode marks our 54th show, so there's quite a back catalog for you to explore if you're just discovering us. Check us out on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're also on YouTube, so if you need subtitles, check us out there. And you can always find our shows at micropodcast.org, and you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Podcast Micro. Thanks for listening. <laughs>